morning, everyone. This is Linda Jackson from Food Focus, and thank you so much for joining us on Webinar Wednesday. It's our great pleasure um, to be hosting the Dairy Standard Agency again today. This is the second in their amazing series about getting um, compliance right in the dairy sector. Um, and so we're looking forward to having a good conversation today about zoonosis. Um, I'm going to give everyone a few minutes just to settle in, grab a cup of coffee. Um, I know most of you would have come straight from another virtual meeting. So let's just give you an opportunity to uh, relax and uh, to settle in. We've got 35 people in the audience at the moment. We're expecting a few more than that. So I'll just give everyone a minute to uh, make sure that they've logged on. We'll chat to you soon. Well, officially, good morning, everyone. This is Linda Jackson from Food Focus, and thank you for joining us on Webinar Wednesday. Interesting topic that we're going to be chatting about today. Um, so why don't we get going with today's presentation? And thank you once again, Jacqueline Woodendahl. Um, she's representing the Dairy Standard Agency today. Thank you, Jackie, for allowing us this opportunity to partner with you. Um, it's been a, a fun ride so far. Um, this is num number two of 10 sessions that are planned for the rest of 2021. So make sure you look out for the next ad, which will be um, highlighting the next session that you can join us in about a month's time. But today's session is really all about the harsh reality of zoonosis. And the transmission of a disease or an infection from an animal to human is, is obviously something that's been quite topical since the whole outbreak of the, you know, coronavirus. Um, but today we're talking about things that are related to food safety and also to occupational health and safety. Um, and zoonoses are not a myth. They are in fact a, a very um, important reality that we as employers as well as manufacturers of dairy products need to be very cognizant of. Unfortunately, brucellosis and tuberculosis is widespread within South Africa and it poses a real risk to humans uh, as well as to our livestock which is why it really needs our attention. And so today we're going to be um, getting some more clarity on, on definitions. Um, we've got a, a veterinarian with us today and she's going to break it down so that we can understand how the disease is contracted, you know, what symptoms we should look out for, and then what actions we should take um, if we identify positive employees or even, you know, posit a positive result within the herd. She's also going to be telling us very practically what we're supposed to do if we do pick up a problem and more importantly, how you can prevent this um, disease or these diseases within your herd. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you um, our speaker and she is Dr. Alicia Clitter. She is a state veterinarian. So today she's representing the National Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. She's based in the Directorate for Animal Health, the Subdirectorate Disease Control. She qualified in 2011. Uh, she tried her hand at small animal practice, uh, dogs, cats, budgies, monkeys, hamsters. Um, and then she has been subsequently employed with the Department um, of uh, Animal Health since 2014. I think she prefers the bigger animals. She's been involved with policy development, particularly in relation to zoonotic diseases, which is why she's the perfect person to have on our panel today. And thank you so much, Dr. Clitter, for making yourself available um, to chat to us um, about these issues. She's currently responsible for One Health Liaison within the Department of Health, or, or rather with the Department of Health and other relevant stakeholders. And this is such an important initiative because at the end of the day, we do need to look at the whole of 
um, you know, the food sector within South Africa and how can we ensure that it's safe um, from farm to fork. So without further ado, I would very much like to introduce you to Dr. Kuta. Alicia, would you mind putting your camera on so everyone can see you? And I'm going to hand presentation over to you so that you can take it away. Good morning, Dr. Kuta, and thank you very much for being with us today. Morning. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Linda, and um, good welcome to everyone that's uh, joining today as well. Um, I really hope that you'll find the presentation interesting. Um, you'll see as well that I'm presenting from an animal health perspective, um, but we're going to be covering the zoonotic aspect of the disease as well. And please feel welcome um, as I go through the presentation. If you have any questions or anything you're wondering about, uh, uh, please send some questions uh, in the comment box. Uh, I'll really be happy to discuss anything uh, afterwards to, uh, to make these diseases more clear. Um, and I also think it's a fantastic opportunity to just to once again create awareness um, on food safety, specifically with regards to zoonotic diseases that can be transmitted through milk. Okay, so today we'll just be covering the definitions of brucellosis and tuberculosis, just to let everyone understand uh, what does this disease do in animals. I'll just quickly be covering the, uh, the relevant legislation from an animal health point of view, where your main focus of control is. We'll be looking at the spread of the disease between animals, because this is where you apply most of your preventative measures. Um, and then we'll also be looking at the clinical signs, disease control actions, and we'll also be pausing at uh, the disease in humans, the, the zoonotic disease. And then we'll also just end off with prevention and biosecurity, um, because as with all things, it's much better and often cheaper to prevent diseases like this versus trying to control them once they've gotten out of hand. Okay, so firstly, what is the fuss with regards to brucellosis and tuberculosis? So bovine brucellosis and tuberculosis are erosive diseases um, that primarily affect cattle, but they can also basically affect any other mammals, including livestock, wildlife, and then also humans. Brucellosis and tuberculosis occur widely across South Africa, and I'll show you some maps later on so that you can see the distribution of these diseases. And we also need to keep in mind that both brucellosis and tuberculosis are controlled animal diseases under the Animal Diseases Act. Okay, so just to clearly distinguish between the different types of diseases that we get, uh, firstly we have bovine brucellosis or cattle brucellosis, and this is caused by the organism Brucella abortus, which primarily affects cattle, but once again it can affect all other mammal species including livestock and wildlife. Then you have your caprine brucellosis or your goat brucellosis, which is caused by Brucella melitensis which primarily affects goats and sheep, but can also affect cattle, livestock, and wildlife as well. So you'll see throughout the presentation, I'll either be referring to predominantly Brucella abortus, uh, because it's a disease uh, that causes the biggest problem in our country, but we have had a few cases of Brucella melitensis as well. Um, so I'll also just be mentioning this disease. And then lastly, we'll be focusing on bovine tuberculosis or cattle tuberculosis, and this is caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium bovis, which also primarily affects cattle, but it can also affect other livestock um, and wildlife species. Okay, so just to cover the legislation that we have for animal health in the country, um, we function under the Animal Diseases Act and also the Animal Diseases Regulations. Um, you might also wonder why, why do we classify some diseases like brucellosis and uh, tuberculosis as controlled or notifiable diseases, or why does government uh, bother controlling them? It's just because there are some diseases that don't only affect an individual animal or an individual animal owner, but it can potentially pose a serious risk to animal health and even public health in the country. And this is then where you need a, a, a bigger uh, group of people working together to control the disease, as it's often very difficult for a single person or single entity to bring these diseases under control. Many of these diseases also can have negative impacts on trade, and they can also compromise the agricultural sector as a whole. So I'll just quickly be going through the criteria to help you to understand why we control certain diseases, because I think this will make tuberculosis and brucellosis control make a bit more sense. Okay, so firstly, if a disease is a zoonotic disease, meaning it can be transmitted from animals to humans, 
Um, there's often a uh, government control with these diseases as well. Another good example to use here, for example, is, is rabies, a disease that can be transmitted from animals to humans, uh, where government intervenes as well uh, to help with control, eradication and vaccination as well. Some animal diseases can spread very rapidly, um, obviously then affecting a lot of farmers. Uh, here you would think of a disease, for example, like African swine fever that's been in the news recently. Uh, if it spreads rapidly, you obviously need a bigger entity or more stakeholders to respond uh, in order to curb the spread of such diseases. Then also diseases that uh, require collective control, brucellosis and tuberculosis being very good examples. If we, if we don't work together to control this disease through, um, through the cattle and the dairy sectors, we'll really struggle to bring it under control. Once again, not just the responsibility of a single person or entity, but it requires a concerted effort. Then you also get your diseases that are a threat to industry. Um, here, for example, comes to mind once again, African swine fever and foot and mouth disease, where it can have potential devastating effects on your, um, your livestock industries. And then some of these diseases are also trade sensitive. A good example, once again, being African swine fever and foot and mouth disease. Okay, and then we also classify any animal disease which we do not currently have in the country. We classify as exotic diseases and they are also automatically controlled diseases as we do not want to expose our animal population to these. Um, I just included in the slideshow, this is just a full list of um, controlled and notifiable animal diseases. Um, and I just provided the link as well. Um, if you need to get access to this list, it just gives you an idea of all, um, all the diseases that government uh, regards as controlled as well. Okay, then just with regards to brucellosis and tuberculosis specifically, there's specific legislation to combat these two diseases. Uh, we have table two of the animals uh, diseases regulations. We've got the bovine brucellosis scheme and then also the bovine tuberculosis scheme. And you can see both of these were um, promulgated in 1988. So that was already quite a while ago. Then for additional information and guidance, we've got a manual for tuberculosis and cattle. We've got one for brucellosis in cattle, and these manuals provide a lot of detail um, on the disease, the diagnostics, epidemiology, and control. And I'll be sharing a link with you again a bit later um, if you would like to have access to these manuals, which contain a lot of good information. Then we also have a tuberculosis testing in sheep and goats manual, and we also have a brucella melitensis VPN, or veterinary procedural notice, and that's for the goat brucellosis specifically. I'm not going to go through this whole table, it's just for background. Um, it just gives you an idea of um, control measures that are described in Table 2 of the Animal Diseases Regulations. For example, in that first column there, it states that all heifers between the ages of four to eight months in the Republic must be immunized once with an effective remedy. So that means that all our heifer cattle in the country um, that are of this age, four to eight months old, by law has to be vaccinated. And this is just part of that concerted effort to build your herd immunity uh, to help to curb and prevent the spread of the disease. Okay, I won't be going through the other columns now, we'll be discussing them uh, later on in the presentation. And then for tuberculosis, a similar thing, just unfortunately we don't have a vaccine in, um, in animals, but once again with the contact animals and infected animals, I'll give you a bit of information later on how we deal with these animals. Okay, so firstly we're going to stop at bovine brucellosis or cattle brucellosis. This is a chronic bacterial disease which predominantly causes abortion in cattle, but it also causes decreased reproduction and production rates. And this is the one that's caused by the bacteria Brucella abortus. And this is the one that's specifically most widespread within the country. With chronic cases, you may also see some hygromas. Those are swellings of the legs. I'll show you a picture later on as well. This disease mainly affects cattle, um, but like I said, it can also affect your sheep and goats and all mammals are susceptible humans being mammals as well, we can unfortunately also get the disease. For cattle, unfortunately, there's no effective treatment. It's because this is a very hardy intracellular bacteria. It's very difficult to reach with antibiotics. So for cattle, unfortunately, if they are infected, they need to go for slaughter. And the, the same would go for sheep and goats and wildlife um, that have contracted the disease as well. It's a zoonosis, it can infect humans, and we'll focus a bit more on that later on in the presentation. Um, and I just included a picture here of a cow that uh, aborted. 
You can see her sniffing and licking um, uh, the fetus that has unfortunately be a, uh, been aborted. And just keep in mind that cattle are very curious creatures. Within a herd, um, if a cow has just calved down or if there's been an abortion, all of the cows come together and they lick and sniff this fetus um, and the placenta on the birth fluids as well. And that's basically your main point of exposure and spread of the disease. So infected cows shed the brucella organism, firstly via the birth fluids and the birth materials or vaginal discharges. So your big thing here is your birth process or your abortion process, which releases millions upon millions of bacteria into the environment. And now you can just imagine if you have all these cattle conglomerating together, um, just how they can easily pick up the disease if only one single cow has had the disease and calved down with it or aborted. Then very important for um, today's discussion as well, the bacteria can be spread through um, unpasteurized milk. And then also your bulls can shed the organism um, in their semen as well, so it can be spread through reproduction. The bacteria in cattle are then contracted through either ingestion or through con contact with the mucous membrane. So if they're sniffing uh, the afterbirth fluids or an aborted fetus or licking a newborn calf, they can easily become exposed to the bacteria. And then of course as well, artificial insemination if you're using um, semen from an infected bull. Here we also need to realize that this brucella bacteria can survive several weeks in cool and damp conditions in the environment. Um, if you have a dry environment that's exposed to UV light, it uh, kills off the bacteria a lot quicker. But you also need to be aware of micro environments. Let's say if you have a shady um, part in a paddock uh, where your water trough is, those are very nice micro environments where your bacteria can hide away for many months and remain a continuous source of infection for animals. Okay, unfortunately, bovine brucellosis is a very complex disease. It's something that's not easy to control because the disease is unfortunately not easy to see. We regard it as a herd disease. For example, if you have a herd of 100 cows um, and you test all of them, and let's say just 10 of them test positive, you regard that whole herd as potentially infected. And this is because the disease has a very long incubation period, um, meaning that it might take a while uh, for the cow when she's become infected until she starts testing positive um, on tests. So you need to treat that whole herd as potentially infected and retest them often to make sure that you can remove all the positive reactors. Your cattle also unfortunately look healthy a lot of the times. Just by looking at them, you won't nece necessarily say that they have um, brucella abortus. And this is also because you don't always see those abortion storms in infected herds, especially if the disease is chronic in herds. Uh, they often stop aborting and start giving um, normal births again, but you still see a decrease in the calving rate. Um, so you still have an effect on reproduction in the herd. So this just in terms of an animal health point of view highlights the importance of testing the whole herd to determine its true brucellosis status. Yeah, I've just included some photos. You can see on the left hand side there, um, it's a cow busy eating a, a afterbirth. Now just imagine this was now afterbirth from a positive cow that was infected with brucellosis and this black cow used to be negative. As soon as she eats that, obviously she'll contract the bacteria and she'll become positive as well and could potentially abort in future. On the right hand side, you'll see a picture of a hygroma. That's just a swelling of the knee. And this is what you typically see in your more chronic cases of brucellosis as this bacteria likes to lodge in the joints as well. Okay, now we're switching over to caprine brucellosis. So that's the goat brucellosis. Um, here we'd just like you to remember as well, let's say you have sheep and goats that have brucellosis, you still need to make sure which bacteria you're actually dealing with. Currently, we have such a high burden of brucella abortus or the cattle brucellosis in the country that it's almost more likely that your goats and sheep may have the cattle brucellosis compared to the true goat brucellosis, which is a lot more scarce in the country. The disease has a very, very similar effect in goats. Um, they also get abortions. They also have decreased reproduction and production um, efficacy. Um, and with this uh, goat brucellosis, once again, it mainly affects your goats, but it can also affect sheep, cattle, mammals, and other wildlife as well. Here also, there's no effective treatment and your infected animals need to be slaughtered to remove the source of infection. And this is also a zoonosis. Unfortunately, the goat brucellosis is even a worse disease in humans than the cattle brucellosis. 
We've only had a few isolated cases in South Africa, so this is definitely not our main focus. Our main focus is on cattle brucellosis, but I think it's good for everyone just to be aware that you do get a goat brucellosis as well. Okay, so yeah, I'm just making the point again that we need to remember that brucella abortus is the predominant um, disease present in the country and that if you pick up sheep and goats with the disease, um, you do actually need to, as a veterinarian, collect the correct samples so that you can distinguish which bacteria is causing the brucellosis and this you need to do through bacterial culture so that you can know the disease that you're dealing with as well. Okay, so that's it for um, brucellosis in um, animals and now we're switching over to bovine tuberculosis. So this is once again also a chronic bacterial disease. It's once again a bacteria that's intracellular, it likes hiding inside the cells um, and it causes chronic and debilitating disease. Uh, it causes decreased production rates, uh, animals thin uh, and eventually they die as well. And this is caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium bovis. So once again, predominantly your cattle that are affected, livestock and wildlife can be affected as well, but pretty much all vertebrate species are susceptible. Your bacteria is shed from your infected cattle, mainly in respiratory secretions, and then potentially in your milk as well, um, if the udder is also infected. So once again, very important disease in terms of food safety. If you do not pasteurize your milk, you can, uh, you can get this organism. Long ago, we used to have treatment protocols for cattle that are infected, um, but this is no longer allowed. It's also just due to antimicrobial uh, resistance, and we rather reserve the antibiotics for human use, so any infected cattle need to be slaughtered to remove them as a potential source of infection. Tuberculosis also has a very long incubation period and disease course. So this is also regarded as a herd disease. So once again, if you just pick up a few positive animals in your herd, you still regard that whole herd as potentially positive and you need to keep on retesting them. Okay, so for tuberculosis, your infected cattle can shed the tuberculosis organism via respiratory secretion. So that's if, um, if they're coughing um, and then also through the milk. And then the bacteria can be contracted by um, other cattle, other animals and humans through, um, through inhalation of these coughed up particles. So this is usually if you're in very close and confined contact with infected animals. And then also ingestion of contaminated feed, for example, if the cattle coughed over hay that other cattle are now eating, and then also just through contact with the mucous membranes. This is also an organism that can survive very, very well in the environment if it's cool and damp. So once again, um, the hotter temperatures and exposure to UV light uh, kills the bacteria quicker. Okay, also once again, tuberculosis, complex disease like brucellosis, it's a herd disease. Um, and once you've picked up a few positive cattle, there might, might still be many more incubating the disease. That's why you need to keep on retesting them. Initially, your cattle may look healthy as well. It takes them many months, often to many years, to get to the point where they really start coughing and thinning for you to physically see the disease. And by the time you see the disease, it's most probably already widespread within the rest of the herd. So this also highlights the importance of testing the whole herd uh, to, to determine their true tuberculosis status. Um, this is a photo I like showing um, when I do presentations to um, vets and animal health technicians as well. And I ask them if, if, let's say you see this online beautiful picture of some cattle with some calves that put, uh, would, would you advise your client to buy these cattle? And as you can see here, this is actually a brucellosis positive herd. But just by looking at them, you see nice fat calves, cows at foot. So this is not your typical picture of brucellosis, even though these animals are carrying a disease that other animals can once again get and humans as well. I also like asking my colleagues if they think brucellosis is really a problem in South Africa and what is the fuss about? So here this map actually illustrates the problem that we're currently dealing with. Um, this map is for brucella abortus or for cattle brucellosis and this is for all cattle um, cases that have been reported uh, between the period of 2015 to 2019, so this is for the last five years. This map is also an underestimation of the true amount of infections in the country because firstly you need to test your herd. Uh, if they're positive they need to be reported to a state veterinarian and then that state veterinarian needs to report it to our national office. 
So the dots that I'm showing here are all the cases that have been successfully picked up and reported to national office. So of course, there'll be many more. You'll also see with regards to the distribution of these red dots, pretty much where we farm with cattle in the country, brucellosis is present. Okay, on the flip side now, I'm showing you a map of, um, of Mycobacterium bovis. So this is the cattle tuberculosis in South Africa. It's for the same period from 2015 to 2019. Um, and you can see we definitely have much less cases of tuberculosis in cattle, but it's still widespread. It occurs in all provinces, so it's still a real disease that we're dealing with. Um, you'll see there in the upper right-hand corner, we've got quite a few cases there in the Kruger National Park. Um, it just highlights once again that wildlife can get this disease. And also in South Africa, we often have that wildlife-livestock interface where diseases can be transmitted between wildlife and livestock as well. Okay, last map I'm showing is Brucella militensis. So this is the goat brucellosis. So you'll see we only had a few isolated cases and this map is actually for the last 10 years, for 2010 to 2019. So this is not a disease of major concern in South Africa, uh, although we have picked it up on a few occasions. Um, I just want to highlight as well, in terms of responsibility of disease control, um, Section 11 of our Animal Diseases Act describes the duties of owners and managers regarding the health of their um, animals, because often we feel it's the state's responsibility, it's industry's responsibility, it's always someone else's responsibility to control diseases. But here it actually states that it's the owner of the animal's responsibility to firstly prevent disease in their animals, to keep them healthy, um, if they're sick, to treat them, and then also to prevent the spread of disease to other uh, owners' animals. So overall, it's a collective responsibility to control diseases. So here, farmers need to know the disease status of their herd. They need to make sure that they test, and they also need to insist on buying negative um, cattle with proof of regular herd testing for brucellosis and tuberculosis. So this is once again how a farmer can safeguard themselves. You can really prevent getting this disease if you make sure that um, you do not buy in animals that are potentially infected. Um, this is a bit more animal health related, the testing interval, so I'll just go through it very quickly. Um, I just basically want to make the point that um, with brucellosis and tuberculosis, you need to test fairly often. Um, in the dairy industry, um, you need to prove that you're negative for brucellosis and tuberculosis in order to um, sell your milk to the milk buyers. Uh, so you test for these diseases twice. Uh, you test for them for brucellosis, you then test again two months later and tuberculosis three months later, just to make sure that you didn't potentially miss any positive animals. And then also if both these tests have been negative, um, then you get a, a BR3 or a TB3 certificate to show that on both the testing dates, the animals tested negative. And this is a figure that gets handed to the milk buyer. Um, note as well that this is not a guarantee. Usually this is valid for, um, for about a year or two years um, until you test again, but I mean anything can happen in between. So the owner still rests on the farmer to make sure that the um, cattle or the animals aren't exposed to other diseased animals. Okay, so then if we go over to infected herds, um, how we control the disease here. It's just basically any cattle herd where you've picked up positive uh, test results for brucellosis and tuberculosis, they automatically join the infected herd program. This herd is then placed under quarantine and under state veterinary control. And this is not to punish the poor farmer because there's now disease on their farm. The main purpose of this is to prevent the spread of this disease to other farms and other entities. That's the main reason for, um, for the quarantine. Okay, so your herd will be regarded as positive um, on blood results for brucellosis and then tuberculin skin test results for TB. And then after you've confirmed it with uh, blood or skin test, you then need to collect uh, samples from animals that are slaughtered so that you can culture these, so that you can prove 100% which organism is actually involved. Okay, so remember as well that if uh, there's any suspicion or confirmation of brucellosis and tuberculosis, all these cases have to be reported to the local state vet office so that they can start implementing control measures. Okay, this I'll just go through quite quickly as well. Um, it just basically states that 
Um, as you go along uh, with, with testing uh, on these infected farms, every time you pick up positive animals, you need to separate them from your negative animals. Positive animals ideally need to be slaughtered as soon as possible as they're the source of infection. And then your negative group of animals, you keep on retesting until you've weeded out all the positive animals. Okay, so in terms of actions taken, like I said, if there's any suspicion or confirmation of disease, it gets reported to the state veterinarian. And then very important is the branding of all reactors. So uh, if animals have got brucellosis, uh, your cattle will be branded with a C brand on the right-hand side of the neck and for tuberculosis with a T brand on the left-hand side of the neck. And it's also very important to have individual animal uh, identification so that you can compare your test results um, to see which animals were positive so that you can effectively brand mark them. And this just serves as a visual cue so that you know which animals are infected. Okay, your state pet will also install quarantine, which involves movement control. It just means that no new animals may be brought onto the farm because they can get the infection then, and no animals may be removed off of the farm because they can potentially spread the infection. You may, you may only send um, infected animals to an abattoir for slaughter. Also important thing to inform the surrounding farmers and neighbors, um, because let's say your fences weren't intact, um, you could have potentially exposed your, um, your neighbor's cattle to um, the disease as well, or you could have gotten it from your neighbor in the first place. Uh, trace forward and trace back activities are also conducted. Let's say you bought in a few animals six months ago, uh, so that you can trace back and see was that actually the source of infection. And then also trace forward, if you sold animals in recent months, uh, the state vets also need to follow up on where you sold those animals to, because if they happen to have the disease as well, you need to be able to control it on the farm that they were sold to as well. So it can become quite a, a, a big and a difficult exercise. Okay, here I just have some pictures for you as well. This shows the C branding on the right-hand side of the neck for um, brucellosis. And here you see the T brand on the left-hand side of the neck for tuberculosis. And I mean, this is so important to show because if you don't know what this C and this T brand stands for and you see a cow like that standing on a farm, you won't necessarily know that this animal is diseased. So once again, very important to create awareness on what these brands actually mean. And this is used to protect farmers from buying these animals unknowingly. So if they at an auction see an animal with a T or C brand, that's a big no. That animal shouldn't even be at an auction. And then it's also to warn and protect your abattoir workers. So if these cattle with T and C brands on the sides of their necks get presented for slaughter, the abattoir needs to know to provide additional um, protective uh, equipment to the workers so that they can slaughter these animals safely. Okay, so like I said, um, if you have any positive reactors as quickly as possible, better to slaughter them to get rid of um, the source of infection and then move to an abattoir under the co cover of a Red Cross permit that's given by the state veterinarian. And you also need to arrange this with the abattoir so that they can expect these cattle to slaughter them safely. Okay, and then at the abattoir, your state veterinarian will also take relevant samples for, um, for culture, um, just to make sure which organism is actually um, involved. And then also you do have some instances where slaughtering is sometimes delayed. You often get farms where most of your animals are infected and it would pretty much ruin a farmer financially to slaughter everything all at once. Um, so here it's just important to remember with brucellosis, once again, it's a disease of reproduction, uh, very dangerous to allow these cattle to calve down on the farm. Uh, if you have no other choice, very important to isolate them so that they calve in isolation um, so that your other negative cattle aren't exposed to them. And then also, for example, if the farmer or the workers go into the camp um, and pick up an aborted fetus or um, calving materials, that they wear the correct personal protective equipment so that they don't accidentally expose themselves to the bacteria. This is just a picture of a Red Cross permit. Uh, this will accompany infected cattle for slaughter to the abattoir. Okay, and then what about milk from these animals that are brucellosis and tuberculosis um, positive? Milk must be pasteurized. Pasteurization is a very, very efficient uh, method of um, killing both these uh, bacteria and raw milk should not be consumed from these animals. 
makes it a bit difficult as well in your communal herds where people um, often utilize the milk from the animals. So here we also advise them to boil the milk uh, before drinking. Um, some articles have advised a souring of milk, but this is not 100% effective in uh, destroying the bacteria. So it's much better to just bring it to boiling point to make sure that the milk that you drink is safe. So it shows you just once again, in terms of uh, food safety, even if you do have animals with disease, if you just pasteurize or boil the milk, you actually do render it safe for human consumption. Important then as well to inform everyone on the farm, including workers, if and any animals are infected with brucellosis or tuberculosis. You must also remember not to feed any of the raw milk to any other animals, including dogs and cats. They're also mammals, so they can also contract this disease. And if they get the disease, they can then also spread it um, to humans and to other animals as well. Okay, so then with regards to prevention of brucellosis and tuberculosis in your herds, yeah, biosecurity is the way to go. You need as a farmer to know the brucellosis and tuberculosis status of your own herd, so you need to have tests done regularly at regular intervals. And then once again, only buy from herds that have tested negative, where the whole herd was tested negative. You should also not mix your animals, your cattle, sheep and goats with other animals, unless they're proven to be negative, um, because you're taking a big gamble if you're mixing them with animals of an unknown disease status. Important to have intact fences, uh, just to prevent animals from um, wandering onto uh, your property, potentially bringing diseases with them. Uh, with brucellosis, like we said in the beginning, all heifers between the ages of four to eight months need to be vaccinated by law. And then also to note that, um, just as cattle can give humans um, cattle tuberculosis, humans can also give cattle their own form of tuberculosis. It's just tuberculosis is an organism that can be spread between all mammals. So here you also need to keep in mind, let's say you have workers that have got an active uh, TB infection, make sure that they seek medical assistance and um, that they're in the proper treatment, because otherwise if they're shedding the bacteria, they can potentially give it to the animals as well. Okay, and this is obviously one, one of my favorite slides, just in terms of prevention. So for good animal management, you require planning and prevention actions. And prevention is always better than cure. And yeah, for me, the saying as well goes, is stitch in time saves nine. So the quicker you react, if there's any disease incidents in your herd, um, really the more drama you save yourself in the long run, because both these diseases that we're talking about today uh, can cause massive economic loss and can pretty much ruin a farming uh, enterprise. So better to react quickly instead of ignoring the problem. Okay, yeah, I'm just providing you with links to um, firstly the bovine brucellosis manual and then the tuberculosis manual as well. There's a lot of information in the manuals with regards to animal health, how we test for the disease, how we follow up, and there's some um, information on the zoonotic aspects of the disease as well. Okay, so I've given you some good background now with regards to how we deal with these diseases from an animal health perspective. So now we're going to switch over to human health and these diseases as zoonoses. Okay, so with brucellosis and tuberculosis, if you are a cattle farmer or a livestock farmer, you, your family and your workers are at risk of contracting zoonotic diseases. If you consume raw dairy products that are not regulated, you are at risk as well. And yeah, I'm saying not regulated because um, there is legislation that can make the sale of raw milk safe, but then you have additional measures that need to be applied to make sure that the herds that these milk originate from keep on testing negative for diseases like brucellosis and tuberculosis, because then you're obviously not including your safety step of pasteurization. Um, so very important to make sure if you consume raw dairy products um, to only consume regulated ones. So the main focus to prevent brucellosis and tuberculosis in humans is to effectively control the disease in cattle and then also the pasteurization of your dairy products as well as this renders them safe for, for human consumption. Okay, so these two diseases are also occupational habits, as it, uh, so it's your farmers, your herdsmen, veterinarians, abattoir workers, animal health technicians, and your laboratory technologists that are often at the greatest risk of contracting this disease, just because they work in close contact with um, animals and diseased animals as well. 
Okay, so if we're looking at brucellosis in humans, and brucellosis now covers brucella abortus, or the cattle brucellosis, and also um, brucella melatensis, or the goat brucellosis as well. Brucellosis in humans is a notifiable disease under the National Health Act. But unfortunately, the incidence of brucellosis in the human population is not currently known. But then we need to ask ourselves, is this disease really considered in patients that present with non-specific brucellosis symptoms, which we'll discuss just now? And also, are your at-risk people and communities adequately um, warned about this disease and do they get tested? So this just highlights again the importance of the One Health approach in controlling zoonotic diseases. For example, if you're a veterinarian going onto a farm uh, where the animals are infected, it's important um, to create awareness so that people realize the disease can be transmitted to people as well. Okay, so for brucellosis, um, it's mainly transmitted through direct contact with the bacteria, usually with the mucous membranes of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, cuts on the skin, and then also obviously through the digestive tract if you uh, consume infected unpasteurized milk. So the main thing is if you then have contact with birth fluids, placenta, aborted fetuses, vaginal discharges of um, infected cows or goats or sheep, you're exposing yourself to the bacteria. So if you do not wear personal protective equipment, your gloves, your goggles, masks, you could potentially be exposing yourself to that bacteria. And then, like we said, your unpasteurized milk from infected um, animals can infect you as well. And then just also keep in mind the vaccines that we use to vaccinate um, cattle uh, and sheep as well um, are live vaccines. So if you vaccinate animals with these, you need to be very careful not to accidentally poke yourself with a needle or to get the content into your nose, uh, mouth or eyes. And if you do, uh, to go to your medical practitioner with a package insert of the vaccine so that they know what you were potentially exposed to. So for brucellosis, your symptoms are um, flu-like symptoms, uh, typically body aches, pains, headaches, tiredness, um, and depression. But yeah, I just want you to note as well, not everyone that gets exposed to the brucellosis bacteria will develop a disease or severe disease. Many people will be exposed, they seroconvert, so they test positive on blood tests, but they didn't necessarily get very sick. But we do need to warn people what the potential symptoms are, so that if you do get sick, you can go and seek adequate treatment. With brucellosis, you often see a recurrent fever, and then you can also see other specific symptoms depending on the organ system that's affected by the bacteria. For example, you can get a pneumonia, enlarged liver or spleen, or even heart disease. So brucella melatensis tends to cause a worse disease in humans compared to brucella abortus. Um, just keeping in mind that the predominant disease in South Africa is brucella abortus, so that's the milder um, zoonosis. So it's very important to seek diagnosis and treatment as soon as possible, um, because if you become ill and you don't get treatment, the disease can become chronic and eventually be impossible to get rid of. This is just a quote I like sharing from a veterinary colleague that contracted brucellosis that said, you won't die of brucellosis, but you will wish that you were dead. And this is just due to the chronic pain, the recurrent fever, the depression, the lethargy that this disease causes. So once again, much better preventing uh, this disease than contracting it. Okay, moving over to tuberculosis, it's a notifiable disease as well under the National Animal Health Act. But once again, unfortunately, we do not know what the true incidence in the human population is. Um, very easy to get it confused with uh, human tuberculosis. Um, and also, often if people are tested for human TB and the test is positive, they do not always further distinguish, is it mycobacterium tuberculosis or mycobacterium bovis? So that's why we unfortunately don't know what the true incidence of the disease is. So for tuberculosis, it's also transmitted through unpasteurized milk from infected um, animals, and then also with, through very close contact with infected cows or goats or sheep. For example, in your milking shed, if there are infected cows coughing there, you can inhale the bacteria that infected um, animals cough up. And then also through direct contact with the bacteria, once again through the mucous membranes of the eyes, the nose, of the mouth, cuts on the skin, digestive tract, so this would be if there's gross handling or cutting into infected organs from, um, from infected animals. Uh, let's say there's a, a home slaughter of an infected cow and there are big tuberculous lesions in the lungs. If someone cuts into that, you know, they can potentially expose themselves to the bacteria. So in terms of symptoms, 
You also get your flu-like symptoms, body aches, pain, weight loss. You also get a fever. Typically, you see coughing. And you can also see other specific symptoms, once again, depending on the organ system affected. For example, um, TB of the skin or spinal TB as well. And once again here, not everyone that gets exposed to Mycobacterium bovis develops disease or severe disease, but it's important to be aware um, of the clinical signs. Also important to seek diagnosis and treatment as soon as possible. It's basically also a long-term cause antibiotic treatment as for human TB. And sorry, I forgot to mention for brucellosis as well, um, there your, your antibiotics are also um, able to, um, to kill the bacteria, but it's very important there once again to start treatment as soon as possible. Um, we're almost at the end of the presentation. Um, here I'm just showing you one of our recent documents if any one of you are further interested um, in the animal health part of these um, diseases. We have the bovine brucellosis control policy, um, which we finalized in 2020. And this is basically just to revamp that brucellosis scheme that was last promulgated in 1988 so that we can start improving our control measures. Okay, so we did a lot of consultation and solution seeking um, with all our stakeholders because this is a disease that has become out of control and we need to figure out how we can rein it in properly and control it once again. Um, so we've developed the policy and our next step now is developing implementation plans for the policy objectives. And just to go through them quickly, um, we're going to be focusing on vaccination of animals, education of veterinarians, of farmers, of all stakeholders involved, testing of animals, movement control, uh, slaughtering of infected animals, effective reporting, and then of course effective implementation of all the control measures. Okay, so just if you need any more information on brucellosis and tuberculosis, you're welcome to go to our departmental um, website. I've provided you the link here. So obviously there's a lot more animal health related information here. You can also go to the National Institutes of Communicable Diseases website. They've got very good um, information on uh, brucellosis and tuberculosis as zoonotic diseases in humans. So you can go have a look. And then we also have the National Animal Health Forum website. They've got fantastic awareness materials um, that can be sent to, um, to farmers and stakeholders, everyone involved in livestock farming. And then lastly, um, the OIE is the World Organization for Animal Health. And they also have very good pamphlets on brucellosis and tuberculosis, giving you a bit more of a global perspective. Okay, so thanks a lot for your time and for listening. And um, I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kluter. Won't you go back to the slide that you had with all of the references, please? Because I'm sure that there are a few people that were uh, uh, yeah. jotting down as you showed it. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you will be more than happy to make your presentation available um, to everyone. And don't forget, we are recording it. So if you did miss something or you, you had a problem with your sound, don't stress. Um, the recording will definitely be available. Wow. <laughs> I have to say um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned because of all of those red dots that are on the map. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, as I said, um, Boris Miller was off the mark before you even started. Um, and then a couple of questions from Clive. So Marie, why don't you jot your questions down in, in the question bar so that we can make sure that we ask it for you. Um, first of all, the, the first question is, how often do you think that dairy farmers should be testing their cows for, for TB and brucellosis? Um, you know, you, the frequencies that you mentioned are quite frequent, and you also mentioned that the processes want you to test your herd in order for them to take the milk. But, you know, from a professional perspective, what would you advise? Um, okay, so firstly, in terms of requirement, let's say it's a dairy herd that's never, for some reason, never been tested before. Um, like I said, you, you would need to test for brucellosis and for tuberculosis twice. We usually do that uh, three months apart. So then after you have two negative tests, then you're regarded as negative. And then for tuberculosis, you usually test every second year. Um, and for brucellosis, a lot of farmers make use of the milk ring test, which is a monthly test that you do. Um, so then that means if you utilize it, you don't need to um, repeat your brucellosis blood test every year. But we still advise, even if you use the milk ring test, to still then at least every second year 
repeat your, uh, your brucellosis blood test. Um, the reason just being the blood test tests your individual animals, whereas your milk cream test comes from the bulk tank sample. Um, so it's a more diluted sample almost that you're testing. Um, but then with regards to, let's say if at any point in between, uh, you maybe bought in new animals or you saw some of your um, cattle were boarded, it would be a good point to test again. It's just, unfortunately, we're sitting with a very high um, pressure of the disease. Um, so it can enter your herd at any time. Um, I, I would say if it was my herd, I would test at least once a year and then um, definitely make sure that you don't have risk factors like broken fences or buying in animals that weren't tested because all those things increase your risk of getting the disease into your herd. Absolutely. Um, and although you said that the milk um, is safe for consumption once it's pasteurized, but I can understand that the farmer sits between a rock and a hard place because if the herd tests positive, the processors don't want the milk, even though they could render it safe. Yeah, it, it creates um, quite a big dilemma um, because your pasteurization renders the milk um, safe. But once again, ideally, you do not want to be dealing with an infected um, product. And even the milk buy, you know, you don't want all that bacteria going through your system, going through your pipes. Um, and also with a farmer, it's, it's not economically viable farming with an infected herd. Uh, your reproduction rate will definitely go down. And with a dairy herd, um, I mean, you, you are very dependent on, on getting new coughs so that you can start a new milk cycle. So if you have a disease like brucellosis and even tuberculosis, which affects your reproduction rate, it's going to start eating away at the profit um, in your herd. So that just shows once again why you're shifting your main focus of disease control to the herd itself, um, because it's simply not viable farming with diseased animals. Mm, absolutely. And I think you made the point about the fact that when you do the tests, um, you know, um, when you're buying, buying in an animal, that it's not just testing that particular animal, but you want to see the records of the entire herd before you purchase a particular animal. Is that how I understood you? Yes, that's 100% correct. It's very important to get the, the history, full history of the herd that you're buying from, um, because unfortunately you get people that um, you know, will test some animals and then they have some positive animals in their herd and then they just pick out the negative ones and sell those ones to you. And those mm. negative animals from a, a positive herd could still be incubating the disease. So you buy them as currently negative, but then maybe three to six months later, they seroconvert and then they have the disease and they start infecting your animals. Uh, so definitely do not rely on individual animal tests you need to uh, rely on herd test results in this case. Now, if the cows are, are branded as a result of um, the, the herd being diseased, does that mean that cow will always be diseased? I mean, you, it's, you know, it's not like tattoo removal. You can just remove the brand. You can't remove the brand. So, so I mean, that cow for all intents and purposes is, 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 is pretty much sentenced to death. Yes, um, with both brucellosis and tuberculosis, once an animal is infected, they're regarded to be infected for life. Um, so yeah, the, the brand mark is basically just to visually identify that animal as that animal eventually needs to be slaughtered. That's unfortunately um, the end for the animal. Uh, if there was effective treatment, you know, it's something that we could have considered. Um, but this animal will just remain a source of infection that can infect other animals and humans as well. So un unfortunately, that brand is a bit of a death sentence, um, but it's important to have it as a visual cue, because if you don't have that, people just start selling them at auctions, and then you um, can unfortunately buy infected animals without even knowing it. Absolutely, and I'm sure, again, that would be, you know, <laughs> For farmers that are stretched economically, you, you know, it's definitely an, an, a way of getting rid of the cattle, but unfortunately, um, spreading spreading the disease. You mentioned that, um, you know, obviously, we're, if we're moving cattle to the abattoir, we have to do this by means of a, a Red Cross permit. But what about the general movements of cattle within South Africa? Because, you know, those little red dots were all over the place, which means there are cows that must be moving from an area where there was an infected herd to another herd and so spreading the disease. So are the controls that we have in, the pla in, in place in the country sufficient to control the movement of animals? Or is it only in the case of a known outbreak? 
Uh, yes, that's actually a very good question. And already to answer that question, no, our movement control is currently not good enough. Um, currently, it's only your herds that have been identified as infected uh, that go under movement control. And your other animals that are untested are still around, allowed to move freely. Um, but this is sort of a, a much bigger thing that um, government and industry is busy tackling. We're tackling it through our veterinary strategy, um, and it's going to be called the LITS SA system, the Livestock mm -hmm. Identification and Traceability System of South Africa. Uh, so the goal of this program is that we individually identify all cattle in the country um, so that we then know when they change ownership and they move to different areas that we can keep track of them so that if there's a disease outbreak or a problem or stock theft so that you can actually trace those animals back to where they originally came from and where they've been. Um, that's obviously a, a massive project that's underway. And I almost want to say our disease control in future is going to be very reliant um, on, a, on an effective, uh, sorry, uh, effective identification system in cattle so that we can properly trace them. Because currently, like you're saying, animals are, be allow, are allowed to move freely and we can't keep track of them. Mm, absolutely, yeah. I think traceability is becoming such an important concept within the food industry. Um, and, you know, in this case, we have to take it back to the raw material and it's got to start, start on farm. But it brings us to an interesting question. Um, and that is, this is all very well if you've got a fence and you have a registered farm, but what about the guy that's got two cows? Um, you know, as sort of rural areas, uh, what about bush avatars? Because there's obviously controlled slaughter um, when it comes to infected animals. Um, how are you guys managing all of those interesting factors that we have in South Africa? Yeah, unfortunately, it, it makes it very difficult because it, it really means that wherever you, you pick up an infection, you need to deal with it on a case by case basis. And dealing with it, for example, in an informal or a communal setting compared to a commercial farm, it's very different and it's really difficult. Um, also, what we found as well is, is the main thing with these diseases is creating proper awareness because you need to explain to a farmer why do you want to control this disease? Why is it important? And why is it in the farmer and his animals best interest to get rid of this disease? Um, and that's step one. That's the most important thing that we need to do. Um, and we already have, I almost want to say our hands full just with, with, with getting to that point. We need to create a lot more awareness. Um, like you're saying as well, if, if you get to a point of, for example, informal slaughter or um, people consuming milk from their own cows, for example, they, you're not going to be able to pasteurize the milk. You need to educate the people, um, you know, to boil the milk. Um, mm -hmm. Also with regards to, let's say they say, okay, yes, I want to get rid of brucellosis in my herd. Um, I would like to slaughter them. Um, if you don't necessarily have access to an abattoir or you only have one or two animals that you um, have to slaughter, you might go for home slaughter methods. But then, for example, it's important for them to know that they can contact their veterinary services to assist them just to show them how to slaughter these animals safely. For example, when you're removing um, the uterus and the other, other the lymph nodes, those are all your high risk organs. So, you know, there's a lot of assistance that can be provided. Uh, to farmers that want to work together to control the disease, to show them how to dispose of such organs safely. And then, of course, with your meat, if it again renders it safe for, for human consumption. So I think that the big thing here with the different farming enterprises that we have in the country is we need proper communication, we need to work together, and we really need to make plans to help each other because there are quite a few unique situations that we sit with, and there's no almost want to say single plan or policy that can just, uh, you know, uh, be applied to every single farmer. You do need to tweak and change a bit. Um, and mm. that just uh, requires good communication. Mm, absolutely. That's I think that you know, we almost have the two extremes within the country, state of the art farming, and then, you know, these communal herds. And, and, and it, it, I'm sure it makes your, your job very challenging. You broke up a little bit over the slaughter. Um, and there's a question regarding the consumption of meat from positive animals. And I think it is what you addressed. You know, obviously the slaughtering process is critical to ensure that the affected organs are removed and they, that is obviously condemned. But the rest of the carcass would be would still be safe for consumption, provided it is cooked properly. 
Yes, or let me first um, explain the scenario. If uh, if you're able to take your tuberculosis or brucellosis infected cattle um, to a commercial abattoir where they get slaughtered safely, uh, where the organs get removed and condemned, um, and where meat inspection is done. Usually those carcasses are also hung. Uh, so the pH drop that you get in the meat as the carcasses are hung is actually sufficient to kill off the bacteria. So those carcasses that are then released from the abattoir they say for human consumption. Um, when it comes to home slaughter of brucellosis or tuberculosis infected animals, um, like I said there, it's, it's good to have um, veterinary services present so they can help you with the meat inspection, help with the removal of organs. With tuberculosis, for example, you'll need to check if the lungs or the liver or the spleen is infected and obviously remove that and not eat that. And then just because of the informal slaughter situation where you don't have the opportunity to to hang and then chill the carcasses to allow for that pH drop, um, there we advise that you need to make sure that you then cook the meat thoroughly to make sure that it's safe for human consumption. So out of an abattoir, you use the meat as per usual, but with home slaughter, just to be safe, um, you just cook it adequately um, to make sure that if there was perhaps any bacteria in the meat that it was killed by the heat process. Absolutely. Okay, I'm turning my focus now. I've got two more questions and um, I, I'd like us to end as close as possible to time. But let's t talk about the human side now. So, so first of all, the little red dots don't link up to the low incidence of the, dis the disease in humans. It doesn't seem to make sense that we are, you know, we don't have more positive cases within humans. So, you know, what I'm hearing you saying is that we are possibly misdiagnosing it. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, I think it's also, once again, we need to improve um, on our awareness of the disease in animals and in humans as well. Because once again, if you're, let's say you're just showing flu-like symptoms, you're coughing a bit, you've got body aches and pains, um, but let's say then within three weeks you're doing better and you're okay, you wouldn't even necessarily go to your doctor or if you went to your doctor and you didn't disclose that you drink raw milk or you farm with cattle with livestock, um, your doctor wouldn't necessarily know to test you for, for brucellosis or for uh, bovine tuberculosis. So I think that's a dual thing. I think if the, if the public um, and especially cattle farmers and consumers of raw dairy products are better informed about the diseases that they can potentially get and the symptoms that they can show, um, you know, that will enable them to seek medical assistance if they show specific symptoms, because they would almost need to physically tell their doctor, please test me for brucellosis or tuberculosis, mm -hmm. because it wouldn't necessarily be the first thing on a doctor's list to, um, to consider. So I definitely think that um, we are under diagnosing both these diseases in humans, uh, just because people and medical practitioners are not necessarily aware of them. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and I think something else which you raised is that I can give my cow TB. So, you know, we the importance of a pre-employment medical for staff coming in and then treating positive human TB cases to protect the herd. Mm. Yeah, that's very important. Once again, that's the one health concept. Uh, animals can affect humans and humans can affect animals. Um, so yeah, like you said, it's very important, um, you know, if you employ new people or people that are currently in your employment to make sure that they, they're healthy and for example, if they're sick or they're showing something like signs for tuberculosis, to get them onto um, proper treatment. I mean, obviously it's better for the workers themselves and then in turn you're protecting your animals from um, potentially contracting human tuberculosis, which can also make your cattle sick. Um, and they will definitely make them test positive um, on our diagnostic tests. So, yeah, important to, to look after your staff for human diseases and for your zoonotic diseases as well. Absolutely. So what's the level of cooperation currently with farmers in South Africa? And, and what are the punitive measures? So, I mean, what if I don't inform you that, you know, I have a positive herd and it causes an outbreak? Is there some punitive measure in place? Um, currently, just in terms uh, of, of how farmers react, once again, we've got all spectrums. You get, you get farmers that are really intent of working together with their veterinarian and with government to get rid of the disease. Uh, you get fantastic farmers out there. And then you also get those that just absolutely refuse to test or if they know they've got positive animals, they just immediately sell them um, 
uh, you know, to unsuspecting uh, victims or people. Um, so you get the flip side as well, pe people with a blatant disregard for the law, um, you know, and for s reporting such cases as well. So obviously, if you do not report the suspicion uh, or the confirmation of the disease, it's a transgression in terms of the Animal Diseases Act uh, that you can be followed up on. Um, and then also, uh, for example, let's say you knowingly sold uh, brucellosis infected animals to another person and this comes to light, um, you know, they could hold you potentially liable for that. Um, I don't think currently that there has been a, a court case specifically for brucellosis or tuberculosis, but to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if we get something like that soon. Um, I really think people need to be held accountable for what they do, especially if they're knowingly um, spreading disease. Mm, absolutely. Last point, I promise. Will you drink raw milk? No. <laughs> 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 it's just, you know, with pasteurization, it's it's such a simple method. You're just eating the milk. You're not adding anything. You're not taking anything away. Um, I see no point in risking drinking raw milk if I can just drink pasteurized milk. I have to agree with you, but I do know quite a few people that don't agree with both of us. And uh, I think the importance of communication and awareness, as you said, you know, is just so fundamental within our country. Dr. Kluter, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've learned so much and thank you for sharing your experience or expertise. There's comments coming in from people that have said they've suffered from brucellosis and they now completely understand why they suffered and, and their, their disease. There's also some comments coming in from some um, EHP saying definitely would like to have a conversation with you because obviously they're dealing with the dairy farmer side when it comes to milkshake audits and, and we'd definitely like to um, you know, chat to you about some more um, opportunities for information. So, so some great feedback. Thank you so much. and. Um, really appreciate your time. To everybody out there, um, it's been great having you. Um, you're welcome to pop through some more questions. I'll leave the um, webinar live for the next two minutes if you would like to pop through a question because all the questions will be coming through to the Dairy Standard Agency and they will definitely be answering them for you. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Kluter. Thank you to the Dairy Standard Agency for the opportunity and everybody enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Great, thanks a lot.